Hello, and welcome to another cultural event from the British Library. My name is Jonah Albert, and I'm one of the library's cultural events producers. Today's event features Rahul Rowe in conversation with Sudha Hazari Singh about the life of Toussaint Louverture. Before they get going, some housekeeping for you. You can pose a question to Sudha by using the question form just below this video. Above me, you'll find a link to the shop where you can buy his book. There's also a link for you to provide us with feedback. Online cultural events are new for the British Library and we'd really like to know what you think. You can also donate to the British Library. The British Library is a charity. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rahul. Hello and welcome to this discussion of Black Spartacus by Sudhir Hazari Singh. Thank you to the British Library for organizing this event and for inviting me to chair it. Um, I want to just begin by briefly describing the structure of the event. I will introduce our author, Sudhir Hazari Singh. Uh, he and I will then have a conversation about the book for about 40 minutes. Uh, and then there will be time for questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to ask members of the audience to submit questions through the question form, which you can find below the video, and I will then read them out for the benefit of Sudhir and everyone else. So I first have the very pleasurable task of introducing Sudhir. Sudhir Hazari Singh was born in Mauritius. He is a fellow of the British Academy and has been a fellow and tutor in politics at Balliol College, Oxford since 1990. He's written extensively about French intellectual and cultural history. Among his books are The Legend of Napoleon, In the Shadow of the General, and How the French Think, all of which have won multiple awards. In 2020, he became a Grand Commander of the Order of the Star and Key of the Indian Ocean, which is the highest honor of the Republic of Mauritius. And I understand that Black Spartacus has just been shortlisted for the Bailey Gifford Prize, which is the UK's premier prize for nonfiction books. So we're very lucky to have Sudhir with us today. Welcome to the event, Sudhir, and thank you for taking time to speak with us. I want to start by thanking you for writing this incredible book. Um, reading it has been one of the most pleasurable, informative and stimulating things I've had to do in the last few weeks. The book's subtitle promises to tell the story of, and I quote, the epic life of Toussaint Louverture, and it succeeds in telling not only the gripping story of the rise and tragic fall of this utterly remarkable figure, whom Sudhir calls the first black superhero of the modern age, but also that of the revolution that he led, the country that he did so much to found, the world's first independent black state, and the birth of nothing less than a new world in which enslaved black people announced the beginning of the end of the institution of slavery. I won't say much more about the book upfront, but I hope that the conversation we're about to have will give our audience more of a sense of the book and its remarkable subject. So let me start by asking you, Sudhir. Toussaint Louverture is a very substantially written about and much mythologized figure. And early on in the book, you describe recent historiographical trends in Toussaint scholarship, in respect of which you say, the ambition behind this biography is to cut through these thickets and find our way back to Toussaint, to return as far as possible to the primary sources, to try to see the world through his eyes and to recapture the boldness of his thinking and the individuality of his voice. And so what I wanted to ask you was whether you were impatient with these thickets, with the manner in which perhaps other theorists have brought their own investments to their reconstruction of Toussaint, what did you hope to achieve by writing this book? Thank you very much, Rahul, and thank you for that very warm and generous introduction and for um, being uh, available this evening to uh, to be in conversation with me about about Toussaint. Um, I was I was impatient, uh, yes, because um, part of this story, uh, and and we are still in Black History Month. Part of this story is a story of erasure 
because we are talking about uh, the Haitian Revolution, which I think is is the most extraordinary revolution of the age of revolutions uh, in the late 18th century. Yet for a very long time, when people talked about the age of revolutions, and you still see it in in books and textbooks that are um, that that are that are still read today, people talk almost exclusively about the French and American revolutions. So some of these thickets are perhaps thicket is the wrong metaphor here because it's really about uh, uh, cutting things and, and removing them from sight. Hence, hence this idea of uh, histories being erased. I mean, erasure seems to me to involve some combination of um, denial, right? So eliminating the story altogether. And, and, and indeed, in, in the context of Britain, eliminating the fact that Britain also tried to uh, fight to restore slavery in the 1790s. And uh, uh, Pitt the Younger, who's sometimes described as an abolitionist, um, was actually the prime minister who um, piloted and financed this uh, counter-revolutionary war that lasted five years um, and, and which ended in humiliating British defeat. So there's denial, um, there's denaturing, so for a long time, the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint were described in, in opposite and very pejorative ways. Um, you know, this was seen as a, as a violent, primitive um, uh, uh, event rather than an, an event which uh, focused on uh, the emancipation of the enslaved people. Um, erasure is also about relativizing things. Hence, you know, so when, when it is acknowledged, uh, often, and you see this very much in, in French writing, the Haitian Revolution is seen as a kind of um, uh, poor, distant relative to the main occurrence, which is what happens in France or happens in the United States. And, and underlying this, of course, is um, a very patronizing, uh, objectifying view of the event, which um, really sort of denies um, agency to uh, the revolutionaries in Saint-Domingue. And so all of this, um, uh, and, and sometimes you see this even in, in, in biographies that are, that are positive about Toussaint, um, but they still somehow don't quite want to give him uh, uh, all, the, uh, all the attributes of agency that I think um, his, his extraordinary life warrants. So that's, that's really what I felt I was up against. And that's why I thought it was really important to try and bring back his voice. Thank you. I wonder if you want to say something about the sources that were most useful to you in writing this book. Um, and perhaps even about sources that surprised you um, in the course of researching and writing the book. Yes, thank you, because um, this book would not have been possible without all the wonderful archival material that I found. Um, now, um, it, it, it is, it, it's, a, it's a characteristic tragedy, I think, of um, post-colonial societies that very often um, the, the colonial uh, uh, entity uh, robbed them of their memory as well. And uh, this happened to, to, to Haiti. All the, all, almost all the documents about <clears throat> the, the colonial history of Saint-Domingue in the 18th century are now in France. And, and so that's where you have to go to find out about um, uh, uh, Haitian history before 1804. But um, I was able to, to, to draw on, on all of those sources. And, and it's an incredibly rich um, series of documents, um, uh, which contain a lot of material by, written by Toussaint himself, because Toussaint was a French general, uh, an administrator, and he ends his career as the governor of Saint-Domingue. So he, produ he leaves behind an absolutely massive paper trail. But the other exciting thing, was um, finding material about Saint-Domingue um, in the United States because America was very interested in the, uh, in the revolution and tried to develop close links with Toussaint Louverture. So in various American archives, I found uh, wonderful documents, uh, including documents from Toussaint himself, uh, Spain as well, and, and Britain. Um, uh, by nature of the British involvement, um, uh, the archives in Kew have uh, 
a lot of uh, documentation, including documentation which highlights Toussaint's uh, dealings with the British. And last but not least, uh, I should mention the British Library, which has a wonderful collection of um, secondary sources um, from the period and um, a unique document, which are, which are the memoirs of um, a French settler, a French administrator uh, who settled in Saint-Domingue in the late 18th century. And he gives us an absolutely unique um, eyewitness account of um, how, Sand how the revolution in Saint-Domingue appeared to essentially a kind of counter-revolutionary Frenchman in the late 18th and early 19th century. This is an absolutely unique document, and I thank the British Library for uh, keeping it um, for two centuries and making it available. That's extraordinary. One of the most intriguing aspects of Toussaint Louverture for me as a political theorist was reading about the manner in which his worldview was shaped by a range of different influences from the culture of the Alada region in Benin, the indigenous Taino Indians of the Caribbean, the culture of voodoo in Haiti, Catholicism, French Republicanism. And yet, despite the convergence of these many influences, there has been a kind of persistent tendency in the scholarship to view Toussaint and his milieu through European categories as the Black Jacobin in the title of C.L.R. James's famous book, as the Black Napoleon, as an instance of Black Carbonarism. I think this is the term that's used to describe the, the, the milieu out of which the revolution emerges, and even as Black Spartacus in the title of your book. And I wondered if these sorts of European framings reduced the range of ideological and political currents through which we might see Toussaint. Why, why does this seem to be such an enduring tendency in the way we perhaps in the West view Toussaint? That's a fantastic question. And, uh, and I, I start by pleading guilty because you know the, the title of the book is uh, in a sense um, uh, a comparison of Toussaint to um, uh, a figure from, um, from antiquity, but a European figure. Um, I would say in, in I mean, the reason I chose that particular title is that it was one that Toussaint himself, it was given to Toussaint by um, perhaps his, his, his closest uh, French Republican ally, a governor called Etienne Larbeau, who gives a speech in 1796 calling Toussaint the Black Spartacus. And, and Toussaint himself was very happy for um, that title to be, to be bestowed upon him. And, and, and he himself was very happy to use it. And, Rather like um, the French revolutionaries, this, this is one area where there is, there is quite a lot of overlap, uh, rather like the French revolutionaries, analogies with Greece and Rome came quite readily to Toussaint. He, whenever he was haranguing his soldiers, for example, he often used to say to them, come on, you've got to be virtuous, you've got to be manly, um, like the Romans, you know, this is, this is how the Romans won their victories, particularly when he was talking about discipline. So, so the Roman... The Roman comparisons were comparisons that Toussaint himself made. And I think if, if they were good enough for him, then they're good enough for me. Um, however, um, those sorts of analogies often are used um, for slightly more pejorative purposes. Um, and I think uh, what, what it does, the kind of work that it does conceptually is just to um, uh, both you know, if, if you're looking at it in a slightly benign way, you can say that what it's doing is giving giving a sort of sense of familiarity um, to uh, uh, either an alien event or or, or 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 a milieu that is very hard to comprehend for from a European perspective. But of course, the consequence of doing that is that it it ends up denaturing the object, and particularly in the case of the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint himself. Uh, <clears throat> relativizing or minimizing completely um, those um, African and Caribbean characteristics. So C.L.R. James, we, I mean, it still is an absolutely magnificent book, but it's a book which doesn't really dwell at all, uh, barely mentions um, the African and Caribbean aspect. And, and, you know, one of the key Caribbean aspects, of course, is, is Toussaint's religiosity. Um, I mean, he is, he is a devout Catholic, and and that doesn't, and because that doesn't really fit in with the, with the sort of mid twentieth century neo-Marxist conception of revolution, 
that gets swept under the carpet. Um, so th there, there's a lot at stake culturally and um, in, t in terms of interpretation um, um, in, in these framings. Thanks. But of course, I suppose Toussaint himself leads us to make these connections because he felt such a deep attachment to Frenchness in addition to everything else that he was. Um, I, I wonder if I could ask you about that very complicated relationship between him and Saint-Domingue and France. You tell the story of his relationship with successive French agents in the colony, you know, with each of whom he masterfully succeeds in setting the terms of the relationship and gaining the upper hand. And yet through all of those encounters, he shows no desire to completely sever the connection with France. So how should we understand his enduring attachment to France and his desire to preserve this connection between Saint-Domingue and the metropole? Great question. Um, I mean, it, it, it's one that if we had the whole evening, we could perhaps uh, start to arrive at some sort of um, uh, comprehension of it because it is very complicated um, because it it, it it works at multiple levels. Um, I think one has to start uh, uh, almost with um, uh, uh, a sort of emotional identification that Toussaint had with the French, and and of course when you when you fight on the battlefield um, with French soldiers uh, in the name of the French Republic, that creates because uh, that's what Toussaint does from 1794 onwards. Um, he's fighting for France, um, and he's seeing comrades of his die on the battlefield um, uh, in order to keep Saint Domingue French. Um, that does create a, a very powerful bond. Um, and his relationship with the French Revolution is a complicated one, um, but I think he always remains uh, right until the very end, true to the original spirit of the French Revolution. And I would say that it's not he who moves away from the French Revolution, it's the French Revolution that moves away from him. Because what happens in France in the second half of the 1790s is that the French Revolution takes an increasingly conservative turn, and that uh, leads to the uh, advent of Napoleon Bonaparte in the 1799 coup. And Bonaparte, in a sense, it is a counter-revolutionary, I would say, rather than a revolutionary. And, and, and you see that um, the first moment where you actually see that um, in full is when he restores slavery in 1802. So of course, Toussaint doesn't want to have anything to do with that France, the France that is counter-revolutionary and the France that is uh, working to restore slavery. But he retains this um, uh, 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 personal, intellectual, ideological uh, attachment to certain ideals of the revolution. And the one that I highlight um, most emphatically um, throughout the book is the idea of brotherhood, of fraternity, which um, he, I would say, um, uh, borrows and then uh, adapts to his own purposes. Because that's that's the other really important thing about Toussaint. He's never purely imitative uh, in anything he does. Um, he's, he's drawing from all these different cultures, whether they're Caribbean or African or, or European, but always for his own um, uh, strategic and tactical purposes. And, 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 and the same is true of fraternity. The way he understands it is actually quite different from uh, the model that emerges with the Jacobins in the 1790s. I'm glad you brought up fraternity because I wanted to press you a little bit on the notion of republicanism, which um, seems to be an important thread that runs through the whole book. It does a lot of work in explaining his political commitments it describes a utopian vision of political community, but also a style of war, a style of living. Um, so I wondered if you could say a little bit about how Toussaint inhabits and maybe refashions this category, and particularly also about the gaps and tensions that there might have been between his republicanism and the French tradition of republicanism. I suppose what I'm getting at is, I'm trying to understand whether he was trying to hold the French the French in the metropole to the noblest of their own standards, or whether there was something lacking even in the most expansive conception of French republicanism that he was trying to show up? Fantastic. That's a fantastic question. And again, I think what it shows is just that even when the trajectories of Saint-Domingue and, and 
revolutionary France are moving in parallel, there are still very important differences between the two entities. Uh, I think one of the things that emerges very clearly when you look at Toussaint's dealings with all these different French administrators, except for Lavo, Lavo, he thinks is an absolutely pure, uh, sincere Republican. Uh, he, he writes almost kind of love letters to him. I mean, that's very much in the in that sort of sentimental style of the late 18th century. But that, he, he thinks that there are some Repu French Republicans who are absolutely pure and, and who are therefore completely c committed and dedicated to to um, uh, uh, defending um, uh, the interests of Saint-Domingue and, and, and of course protecting the people of Saint-Domingue from, from enslavement or, or re-enslavement. But his dealings with other French administrators um, are much more problematic. Um, uh, and that's where you get into this uh, rather interesting conflict where you can see that they are treating him not, um, you know, to use kind of Kantian language, not as an end in himself, but as a means. So, uh, and, and, and they're very patronizing, very condescending and, and very unwilling to, to, to recognize um, the remarkable um, uh, power and uh, talent that he has. Um, so that's what leads him to become increasingly suspicious of the French uh, at one level, of the French Republic at one level, because this is a colonial republic. So we have to remember that the interactions between France and Saint-Domingue are asymmetrical because France is still regarding itself as a colonizing power. So when a republic, when a country behaves as a colonizing power, the fact that, it, that it's a republic ultimately ends up not meaning very much. It, it's, it, it's the colonizing dynamic that ends up playing out. And that's what Toussaint experiences. But in terms of his own uh, uh, beliefs and values, what I try to do is sketch out. Um, I mean, he, he's not a theorist, but he's someone who is constantly driven by ideas and values. So you have to reconstitute um, uh, his beliefs and values. But I think once you do that, you see that he's very clearly driven by certain absolutely fundamental uh, Republican objectives. Um, one is to prevent his uh, people from being re-enslaved. The other is to uh, develop this notion of fraternity, which has two prongs. One is um, the, the unification of uh, the Black people uh, of Saint-Domingue, all the Black people, whether they're Creole born, born, born in the Caribbean or uh, as they were called at the time, Bosal, um, born in Africa. And, uh, uh, and one should remember that 60% of the adults in the late 18th century, Saint-Domingue, were born in Africa, right? So, so Saint-Domingue was not, was, not was not their place of birth. So Toussaint's trying to bring them together um, and, and, and tell them that they form a, a community, as it were. But fraternity for him is also about creating harmony or reestablishing harmony between the blacks, um, the black people, the, the white settlers, and uh, the people of mixed race, and that's a that's a key ingredient um, in what he's trying to in what he's trying to achieve. So fraternity is is the second pillar of his um, of his republicanism, and the third, um, and you see it uh, as driving um, all his policies, is I think this notion of the common good, um, what he's trying to build is a kind of fraternal community in which everyone is working for the best interests of Saint-Domingue. And, and that is what eventually, you know, uh, leads him into a kind of collision course with the French, because of course, the colonial dynamic doesn't really allow for um, a, prior, a prioritization of the interests of the colony against those of the metropole. So that that's what, eventually becomes uh, the um, uh, major conflict between Saint-Domingue and the French, because the French can't, can't even countenance the possibility that uh, a colonial entity uh, uh, is going to be able to behave uh, uh, in an autonomous way, because that's what Toussaint wants. He doesn't want to break from France, but he wants to be able to, um, when, when it's necessary um, and when it's in the interests of Saint-Domingue, follow policies that are not that are in saint domingues interest rather than in the interest of the metropole and of course this vision of fraternity also leads to a particular conceptualization of race and i wonder if we could talk about that um mm. 
in particular, I'm curious about whether the opportunity to have warm relationships with people like Lavo uh, account for his ability to envision a, a multiracial community, a kind of proto-civic nationalism, if you like. Uh, I'm not sure if that's perhaps uh, too presentist uh, a term to foist onto him in that time. But um, this is an interesting contrast to the views of some of his contemporaries who would have taken a much more, uh, you know, the Macandalus line that you write about, um, crudely kill all the whites. Um, can you perhaps tell us something about these contrasting views of race and the possibility of racial coexistence? that um, obtained in that time and place. Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and in that uh, dialogue and conversation that Toussaint is having and, and which, which, I was, uh, which I try to reconstitute because um, many of the, particularly his early speeches are speeches that he's giving to his fellow, to, to his brothers, his black brothers saying to them, and, and they, for reasons that you can understand, are just incredibly suspicious of white people in general, right? These are people who have enslaved them for um, several generations, right? And suddenly, uh, from, from 1793 onwards, um, Toussaint, or, or rather 1794 in Toussaint's case, um, black leaders are, are telling uh, 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 their, their, their brothers and sisters that you can trust these whites because they are they are people who are bound by um, honorable objectives. And it's incredibly hard for uh, a lot of black people to accept that. And Toussaint talks to them and tries to persuade them that, that this is necessary. Um, and um, this is where you see the kind of um, didacticism um, of his approach. Um, and you see him um, spelling out this kind of vision of what uh, a multiracial uh, future community should look like. Um, and I think this is where also his religiosity comes in, because um, some of these values that he's preaching, um, for example, the emphasis on forgiveness and, and reconciliation, he's getting from, uh, from, his, from his Catholicism or, or, or his particular uh, brand of Catholicism. Um, and uh, he's also drawing there on, uh, 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 on um, uh, other forms of spirituality too. Um, so it's a very, um, it's a very uh, diverse, almost kind of eclectic range of arguments that he draws upon when he's talking about race. Um, the other thing about um, his his language when he talks about race, which is very striking, is that perhaps the, the single term that comes up mo most often is the word honor. Um, in other words, he, he's not only interested in in, in thinking about race in terms of rights. Now, of course, you know, uh, rights really matter. And, and the fight, particularly in the first half of the, of the 1790s, is a fight to um, emancipate and therefore to, to establish concretely in law um, uh, uh, on a kind of juridical basis that uh, black people are equal to, uh, to all the other uh, communities. But once that's achieved, um, Toussaint is interested in something much bigger, much grander, which is actually to prove that uh, black people are, are not just not just just as competent as uh, as other groups uh, to uh, to carry out a wide range of tasks, but but better, right? And so um, that that's where this concept of black honor comes in, and uh, and it has very strikingly modern uh, echoes too. And, and in that sense, um, it's very instructive to to read him because he's really. Uh, and there's such a long and, and distinguished tradition of this um, uh, uh, across the uh, uh, black, black communities across the across the world of emphasizing this notion of honor. I was really struck by what you said about such a high proportion of the population of the colony being African born. And I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about the, the cultures that they came from. Uh, and in particular, the cosmologies that might have animated their political worldviews. So voodoo makes a frequent appearance in the book as a site for political thinking and resistance. It seems to supply the ideas and the networks out of which some of the precipitating events of the revolution emerge. Um, I'm thinking of the famous Boakai Man ceremony, for example. 
And Toussaint is seen by his followers through the lens of the Haitian Loise, the deities such as Papa Legba and Ogun Fer, you tell us. Yet later in life, in 1800, he bans voodoo in a decree that prohibits nocturnal assemblies and dances, presumably of precisely the kind that produced the revolution. So how do we make sense of the place of voodoo in this revolutionary and post-revolutionary milieu? It's a fantastic question. And um, I think, again, one needs to almost distinguish different levels. Um, uh, I mean, one, one, one preliminary uh, remark here is that uh, as with, um, you know, suppose I said the word Christianity, you know, uh, it, it's a term which would cover so much uh, and so much variation. I think when we're talking about voodoo uh, in, in late, late 18th century Saint-Domingue, it's, it's a sort of umbrella term which actually uh, covers and 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 I hasten to add I'm not a specialist, but it but it stretches across actually quite a quite a wide range of um, spiritual systems of belief, um, but but it is it is a recognizable um, way of life, um, and and you see it from uh, uh, from the third quarter of of, of the 18th century, and and you see the the increasing role that it's uh, uh, occupying, particularly uh, uh, in the plantations. Um, I mean, we have documents that kind of uh, underscore the extent to which um, voodoo is part of the daily life of um, the men and women who, who, are, uh, who are still enslaved at this, at this time, but who are, um, who are working on the, on, on the plantations. And I think Toussaint's attitude to it, uh, I would say, first of all, if you think of it as a, as a, as a, as a personal ethic, um, this is something that uh, I, I find a, a lot of direct evidence of. Um, so uh, he wears a, a red handkerchief on his head, um, and that's the that's the that's the classic symbol of Ogun Fair, the the, the the spirit of war, and uh, and and that's also a way of communicating with his with his own troops, as it were, uh, many of whom he knows are. Are adepts of of the Vodou religion and and the Vodou way of life. Um, in fact, the the very name Louverture, and this is what I describe in the book, uh, faces two ways, faces three ways actually, because it Ouverture is a nod to the Enlightenment and the idea of intellectual and personal emancipation. But uh, one of the Vodou uh, uh, loas or spirits is Papa Legba, who is the guardian of the crossroads and. He's this. He's the figure who allows you to make the transition from uh, 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 something to one form of life to another. So when he chooses that word, he, when he chooses that name, Louverture, in 1793, he's actually also speaking to his own uh, primary con constituency, and that that's very characteristic of Toussaint. He, he he at the same moment he's very often using. Um, uh, language language that can speak to multiple audiences, uh, and of course, um, Vodou has African roots, um, and uh, and since the majority of the uh, uh, adults were were African born, he's very keen to kind of retain um, that uh, capacity to, to communicate with them. Now, all of this is personal. Right, individual. Um, however, Toussaint is also someone who's who has responsibilities, and particularly in the later 1790s, um, he's trying to uh, hit one of his primary objectives uh, economically is to kickstart the, uh, the the economy and particularly the plantation economy. I mean, we might we might get to talk about it a little later, but. But one of the one of the fundamental problems he starts to face in in in, in restoring you know, to put it very quickly, in restoring some kind of uh, discipline uh, in the labor force, is that many of them are practicing voodoo. And, and voodoo, as you, as people will know, uh, is something that happens at night and in the early hours of the morning. And so if you're trying to uh, uh, in, instill and, and maintain a kind of system of, of, of discipline among the workforce, it's very hard to to allow Vodou to continue. And, and I think the 1800 decree uh, has to be seen exactly in that context. He's trying to, it's not that he's necessarily against Vodou per se. Um, of course he isn't, 
Uh, but his primary objective uh, in 1800 and in 1801 is to restart the, the economy. And, and, and viewed from that perspective, Urdu is actually um, an impediment. That's really interesting. So this is also a moment of um, a shift from slavery to perhaps a kind of state capitalism, if you like, or a state plantation system. Um, and it's a shift in Toussaint perhaps also from revolutionary to, as you said, the man with responsibilities, the governor. And I wonder if these shifts change the meaning or the possibility of freedom as he begins to take on these new responsibilities. I'm thinking particularly about the more uncomfortable aspects of the 1801 constitution, which of course many of his critics pointed out at the time, um, the centralization of power, but also the measures that tied the cultivateurs to the plantation system. And I was thinking here of Marx's category of wage slavery, which of course he comes up with 50 years after these events, mm -hmm. um, which invites us to think about the resemblances as much as the differences between forced and badly remunerated labor. So the question is, does Toussaint as governor roll back from his lofty conceptions of freedom? Should that trouble us? Or should we read this as necessary accommodations that he had to make, he had no choice but to make? I mean, I would say more the latter, simply because if you're looking at the, the, the context in the late 18th, early 19th century, um, he's already starting to sense that um, not only uh, uh, is the revolution uh, being threatened, but, but, uh, but that the principal shield that he had hoped um, would uh, 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 deflect some of these predatory uh, uh, moves that people wanted to make against Saint-Domingue, his principal shield, which was France, was moving towards um, some sort of uh, uh, restoration of slavery. And, and this isn't just about Saint-Domingue, you know, because in fact, when the French restore slavery, they don't do it first in Saint-Domingue, they do it in Guadeloupe, and they do it in uh, some other Caribbean colonies. So, so this is a kind of general policy, as it were, rather than something that is Saint-Domingue specific. And, and given that that was his primary uh, uh, objective, well, I'd say his, his two primary objectives by the late 1790s are to protect, protect his people from re-enslavement and um, maintain um, the regime that he has created and the social order that he has created. Now, the only way that that can happen is if Saint-Domingue is able to continue to export and, and by then, he's already established quite a quite an intricate network of trading relations with um, the Americans and and even the British. Right, the British are very keen to trade um, with with Saint Domingue because Saint Domingue produces things that that the British need uh, in the Caribbean, and that is his lifeline. And therefore. Um, once you think of it in those terms, uh, it becomes really, and, and I'd put it very simply, uh, a question of the survival of the revolution. Uh, if, if there were many other revolutionary states at the time, I think Toussaint might have been able to, to think about this differently. But he is the only, it is the only state of its kind. Um, and therefore, uh, he puts the, um, the, the survival of the revolution um, uh, as, its, as his highest priority. And his economic policy, I think, ends up reflecting that. That's extraordinary also because it almost prefigures the dilemmas that so many subsequent revolutions have, whether it's the, the Bolsheviks or um, Cuba or you know, any of a number of examples that we can think of. So in a sense, the Haitian revolution seems to, seems to prefigure uh, or offer the prototype of all modern revolutions that, that come after it. Um, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, but, I, but there I would add one other thing, which I think is, is something distinctive of Toussaint, because among revolutionaries, and we've seen this throughout the 19th and the 20th century, there's often the debate about whether you consolidate or whether you internationalize. Toussaint, I think, even if he had the means to internationalize um, with someone who, who did not believe in internationalization, and he didn't believe in it for, I think, a very... Um, 
uh, interesting reason, which is that he thought that if a revolution was to succeed, its sources and its roots had to come from within that society itself. In other words, he did not believe that you could promote revolution by force of arms. And, and that, you know, that, that's a big debate among revolutionaries. But Toussaint had a very clear view and a very clear understanding that um, the only reason a revolution works is if it's completely embedded in the spirit and the values and the practices of, of, the, of a, a particular people. Yeah. Um, just a quick reminder to the audience that you can send in questions using the question form. Um, we're going to move into the last uh, section of our structured conversation. So this is your opportunity to get those questions in. Um, so the, Toussaint comes across as a truly remarkable man in everything you write about him, you know, fiercely intelligent, a creative thinker, a brilliant military commander, master tactician, diplomat, practitioner of the medical arts, skilled horseman, indefatigable. Sometimes he sounds too good to be true. And mm -hmm. this made me think or wonder how you distinguish myth and legend from fact, particularly when you're dealing with oral history sources. But also, is it even important for you to do this? Because I sense that you're as interested in the legend and in the way the legend travels. And your penultimate chapter is a really fantastic uh, study of the, the way in which the, the legend, the myth of Toussaint travels and the work that it does. So, but my question is, is there a tension between reconstructing the life of Toussaint in a way that does justice to the sources but also tracing and taking pleasure in the many appropriations of his name and legacy that try to do radical work? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, I mean, part of the answer is that I'm interested, and, and I've done this before when, when writing about uh, Napoleon and de Gaulle, for example, I'm interested in, in myth as, as, you know, as social constructions, if you like. In other words, these are things that um, people uh, put together for particular purposes. And, and sometimes the leaders themselves do this. Uh, Toussaint, I should say, is not that interested in, in promoting himself. Um, he doesn't, uh, there is a sort of cult of the personality, but it, by, by the late, late 1790s in, in Saint-Domingue. Um, but I, as far as I can make out, it's, it's a spontaneous one and it's one that is based on the sort of general recognition that this person is exceptional. You often hear the, the language of exceptionality, particularly among the, um, the white settlers um, who, who use it as, as a kind of resource almost to, 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 to entrust themselves to him. They say, oh, he may be black, um, and, and we don't, we may not trust black people in general, but he's an exceptional black. Um, he has, he has qualities that, uh, you know, in in their own kind of racist view of the world, they just couldn't believe that um, all black people could be like Toussaint. But but they were prepared to believe that there, there were a few who could be like him. Um, but but in terms of uh, uh, the myth um, and the way it develops uh, uh, after Toussaint's death. I think this is just um, a, a remarkable testimony, really, to the, um, the almost the sort of spiritual power of the Haitian Revolution, because there's this um, uh, quite remarkable dichotomy between the erasure of the Haitian Revolution in, if you like, uh, white Western um, historiography, because it does disappear for a long time, you know, almost almost two centuries, it's sort of wiped out, and um, the phenomenon, the phenomena that I trace in, in the final chapters of the book, which is, uh, you know, it doesn't disappear completely because it survives in people's imaginations, it survives in oral traditions, it survives in stories that uh, people tell to each other and tell to their children. I mean, that's how the Toussaint legend develops in the United States among African Americans. Um, um, these stories of uh, uh, Toussaint and his uh, heroic uh, military achievements um, are told to children. Um, and, and you can almost trace that continuity all the way from the early 19th century to the mid 20th. Um, uh, so that's how um, political legends uh, are, are transmitted. And, and I think what is really interesting about Toussaint is that you can find 
And if you look closely enough, um, you don't need to rely on written sources. Um, uh, a, a lot of this is happening uh, through oral uh, oral sources or or through through songs, through through portraiture. Um, uh, uh, one one of the most remarkable um, uh, works of art that I came across about Toussaint was a collection on the Haitian Revolution by the African American artist Jacob Lawrence, um, who produces these wonderful panels in in 1939. Uh, and 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 the reason I love them is because they, uh, I mean, th there are short descriptions beneath each of them, but the power is in the image. And when you look at these images of Toussaint, what you can then imagine is how how people who were not literate saw him, because that's what that's what Jacob Lawrence is doing. He's he's sort of projecting that absolutely marvelous uh, uh, reconstitution of the Louverturian epic um, by uh, 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 black communities across the Atlantic. Um, so this is a story that. That, that runs right across the 19th and the 20th centuries. Okay, I think this might be a good opportunity to take some audience questions. So uh, the first question is from Rachel Douglas. Um, Even for so well-documented a historical figure as Toussaint Louverture, there are many things we don't know about him or have learned relatively recently, such as his ownership, his own ownership of slaves himself. Which sources did you find the most useful? Were there archive sources in Haiti that you found useful? And where was most of your source material located? Thank you, Rachel. Um, unfortunately, there weren't that many sources um, that I found uh, in Haiti uh, itself. I mean, it's wonderful to talk to Haitians, of course, because you get a sense of where Toussaint lives uh, in the Haitian imagination, and he occupies a very special place. But in terms of sources, uh, the bulk of the material is actually in France, in the um, in the Archive Colonial um, and in the Archive National, and also because France was the colonial power, and uh, 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 um, uh, many of the, uh, particularly the the coastal uh, towns and cities, uh, were centers of of shipping. So places like Bordeaux and Nantes um, also have. Uh, uh, not insignificant uh, holdings. So um, th th that was my main uh, source as far as the, the bulk of the documents were concerned. As far as Toussaint's um, pre-revolutionary pre life, uh, you know, pre-1791, the sad thing is we have very few documents, in fact, um, just a handful. So we still don't know for sure when exactly he was born. Um, uh, which year uh, he uh, uh, was emancipated. We think it's sometime around the mid 1770s, but the manumission uh, document um, hasn't appeared. I mean, I think it, it probably may well emerge at some point because there's a lot of this material that hasn't been um, completely searched, particularly in, in French departmental archives. So uh, I haven't given up hope that that will, will reemerge, but, um, Sadly, the, the pre-revolutionary life of Toussaint is one where documents are relatively few and far between. One more question from Rachel, who has herself worked on, on Toussaint. So did your take on Toussaint Louverture change over the time you were working on this book? I've worked on C.L.R. James and the different play and history versions of the Black Jacobins. I think the book is called The Making of the Black Jacobins. Mm. Over time, James's portrayal of Toussaint Louverture changed quite considerably. So did, did, did your own take change over time as you were working on the book? Um, I mean, not as much as I think, uh, I mean, the, the time difference between uh, the two editions of the Black Jacobins is, um, is quite, quite considerable. You know, the first, first edition, I think it dates from the late 1930s. The, the later edition is, is in the 19. 19, early 1960s, I think. So, so that's a lot of that's a lot of time. And of course, you're always slightly shaped by the the wider uh, political and geopolitical context. So, what's happening in the 50s and 60s is, you know, anti-colonial revolutions are are, are on the march in a way that that, that uh, uh, could only be, um, you know, that it was only a sort of glimmer uh, in the 1930s. 
And I think that does shape to some extent um, CLR James's take. Um, my my intuition, let me put it that way, um, and 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 that's what I hope to have uh, con eventually confirmed in the writing of the book, is that one needed to take Toussaint's republicanism seriously, right? In other words, the interpretative key to understanding Toussaint and indeed the Haitian Revolution was to think about this republicanism, but to think about it as a as a Creole republicanism, a republicanism that um, that rested on. Um, local uh, Antillean um, Caribbean um, considerations, um, and 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 that was mediated through <clears throat> the um, political and ideological uh, uh, preferences of someone like Toussaint, and that's what I tried to do in the book, and that's that's what fortunately um, uh, the the archival sources um, allowed me to do. So, so in that sense, I didn't really change very much. Uh, I found my uh, uh, initial intuitions, thankfully, uh, confirmed. Thanks. Um, a question from Autumn. To what extent did Louverture or key figureheads contribute to the original outbreak of the Haitian Revolution? That's a great question, uh, Autumn. And um, I mean, uh, although the, uh, the the documentation is is scant there too, I think there's fair amount of circumstantial evidence that shows that Toussaint played actually quite a major role um, in planning uh, uh, the outbreak. Uh, what happens from the late 1780s is that um, the uh, the sort of plantation elite uh, among the enslaved uh, 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 start to meet regularly um, in the north, in the northern part of the territory. And they meet on Sundays um, and, um, uh, 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 and the planters thought that this was basically um, a, a social event. So, so they were very happy to, to allow it. But what, what they were doing was in fact, uh, beginning to exchange information and uh, 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 prepare the ground for uh, an insurrection, uh, and and that is uh, uh, what is what is planned in the middle of 1791. And the reason why I think Toussaint is very centrally involved is first of all his name doesn't appear anywhere, and that's absolutely classic Toussaint because um, uh, he had an absolute gift for. Um, uh, looking absent uh, in places that he were and, and, and appearing present in places that he wasn't. Uh, it was one of his uh, almost kind of magical uh, qualities. But when you look at the names of the people who were actually, who, you know, who, who have been documented as being the, 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 the ring leaders, as it were, in, in that early 1791 insurrection, um, they're, they're all people who are very closely uh, connected in one way or another to Toussaint. So um, he's very much there uh, right from the outset. A question from Tajila Olaya. How did Islam influence the Haitian revolution and Toussaint Louverture? Um, that's a very interesting question, uh, Tajila. Uh, I think what, what you see uh, in, I mean, I think, the most uh, the most interesting connection may be through Macandal. Uh, we don't know much about Macandal, but uh, some people believe that uh, he was uh, he was uh, 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 someone who practiced the Islamic faith, and um, Macandalism um, has some uh, elements that may tie tie it to to the Islamic faith. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, I, I must say my own research didn't really find a huge amount of information when, when it came to um, the revolutionary period itself. Because of course, by the time you've reached um, the early 1790s, Macandal has been gone for um, nearly 30 years. Um, so, um, uh, and Toussaint is in many respects um, the person who uh, picks up the torch, as it were, after him. But he is really uh, someone who's trying to take the revolution in a, in, a, in a rather different direction. So another question is, did you find yourself focusing on particular dimensions of Toussaint's life and less interested in others? Um, there's little in the book, for example, about his personal life. Um, 
Yeah, well, that's uh, less by uh, uh, choice than simply uh, I, I wanted to stay as uh, faithful as possible to the available records and, and documents. And although Toussaint was an absolutely voracious uh, letter writer, you know, at the height of his power, he was dictating uh, uh, several hundred letters a day. You know, he had five secretaries and he would be talking to each of them and, and dictating different uh, bits of the letter to them uh, and kind of wearing, wearing them down. Um, but all of these are, as it were, public you know, political administrative letters. Um, <clears throat> every now and then, you get uh, a sort of a little hint um, of some of his of some of his private life. But you know, I think he's a revolutionary, and, and and very often, revolutionaries, particularly in revolutionary times, and 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 we must never forget that these are revolutionary times. Um, uh, revolutionaries don't really have much uh, of a private life, um, and he is someone who devotes himself, you know, 150 percent to uh, to the cause. Um, some of his some of his private letters were uh, found by the French when they uh, landed in uh, in Saint Domingue in um, in 1802. You know, the, the Napoleonic invasion, as it were, and uh, some of those letters we know uh, were destroyed. Um, so there might have been more, as it were. But I think, um, you know, I don't think they would add anything um, fundamentally uh, uh, to uh, our picture of him, because, uh, as I say, he's, he's someone who's kind of primarily driven by this um, uh, sense of, um, you know, um, uh, belonging to and, and operating in the public sphere. A question from Atika. How did Toussaint reconcile his Catholic faith with the voodoo traditions he embraced? I could be mistaken, but they seem sort of antonymous. That's a great question, Atika. And I think um, um, part of the answer is that uh, one has to always remember um, with um, identities um, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in a place like Saint-Domingue in the late 18th century is that people are constantly um, negotiating them and uh, 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 these different social and cultural forms are, are, are always in interaction with each other and, and the relationship is never one that's completely static. So I think Toussaint is the sort of person who doesn't think to himself that, he's, that he has to choose between his Catholicism and his embrace of certain aspects of, of the Vodou way of life. Rather, and this was very characteristic of the way he operated, he picked from um, you know, ideologies or belief systems or, uh, uh, or, or, or ways of thinking. He picked elements that he felt could, use, could, could be useful to him or, or, or fitted with his own uh, uh, ethics and uh, adapted them to his own purposes. Um, I mean, he was very, um, he was, I think one of the reasons why Vodou really mattered to him was because he could already see that it was a source of unity among um, uh, 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 the black communities of Saint-Domingue. And, and unity was something that was really important to him, right? And, and he wants to be close to uh, the people. Therefore, this is not something that he can afford to, uh, to ignore. On the other hand, um, that doesn't stop him from uh, 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 retaining and celebrating his, his own uh, Catholic beliefs. Um, but, but I think when you start looking uh, more closely at um, uh, uh, these places, um, or if you, if you look at the way Catholicism adap is adapted um, um, in, uh, in uh, communities of enslaved, and even, even, even in, in communities after the, the, they've been emancipated, you see, you see, um, you see it in Haiti today that um, you know Voodoo and Catholicism sometimes uh, are, are, are antagonistic, but sometimes they cohabit um, very easily. We're running out of time, so I think maybe what, there's time for one last question from me. Um, Reading that penultimate chapter, it seems quite clear that there has never been a moment in the last two centuries when 
Toussaint has not been important in the black radical tradition. And yet in the white dominated academy of which both you and I are a part, it, it feels as if there has been a recent resurgence of interest in the Haitian revolution and in Toussaint Louverture. Do you, would you agree with that? And if so, why do you think that might be the case? Um, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think part of it is to do with um, the more general uh, resurgence of interest in, in the Haitian revolution. Um, and uh, and that is is something which I think is 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 to be welcomed and um, and it's taken people to to find different kinds of sources, particularly social historians, social and cultural historians, have found very interesting things about the Haitian Revolution, which have uh, really changed our perspective on 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 uh, on what revolutionary activity, uh, how we should think about revolutionary activity, almost. But I think there is also a, a slightly less uh, a welcome side, perhaps, uh, uh, in the West, which is to identify with particular individuals because they are reassuring and, and they are comforting. And, and I'm very struck that revol you know, in, in interpretations of revolutionary moments, Western historiographies sometimes need to have a sort of quote unquote good guy um, uh, that they can lead off against the bad guy. And so, um, you know, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King would be um, another another one of these false oppositions. You know, the good uh, uh, turn the other cheek, uh, Martin Luther King versus the, the 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 sort of violent and destructive Malcolm X. Um, there's a, there's a great biography that's just come out by Daniel Joseph called The Sword and the Shield, which really fundamentally demolishes that uh, that kind of schematic opposition. Or if you think of uh, the way people in the West talk about Mandela, you know, ah, saintly, you know, uh, great believer in reconciliation, um, uh, forgetting that Mandela was someone who always talked about uh, the need to retain um, uh, the armed struggle until um, such a moment as um, the white order had was prepared to negotiate seriously. You know, they, they kept telling Mandela, you know, we'll, we'll let you out of jail, but provided you renounce violence. And he said no. Um, so um, these false oppositions uh, are always there. And, and, and in the way that um, the historiography has thought of the Haitian revolution, the false opposition is between Toussaint and Desalines. You know, Toussaint being the nice um, conciliatory um, believer in uh, a, a multiracial republic, and Dessalines, the sort of bloodthirsty, violent um, uh, 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 black nationalist, as it were. Uh, but actually, you know, when you look at the way the war of national liberation was conducted in, in Saint Domingue, as it prepares to become Haiti, you see that Toussaint and, and Dessalines were absolutely um, in agreement about the strategy that that should have been pursued in order to defeat the French. So um, these figures sometimes serve these instrumental purposes, but actually they take us away from the fundamental, fundamental elements of unity that we find in these uh, uh, great revolutionary moments. Thank you, Sudhir. You've given us a tremendous amount to think about, um, both about the Haitian Revolution, but also its afterlives and the ways in which it continues to matter in, in the world today. Um, that's all we have time for tonight. Uh, thanks Thank to you, our Rahul. audience. And remember to buy the book from the link that you can also find on your screen. Thanks and good night. A big thank you to Rahul Rowe and Suda Hazari Singh for the event, and also a big thank you to you, our lovely audience. Remember that you can buy the book by clicking on the shop link. Do please provide us with feedback. We really would like to know what you think, and if possible, donate to the British Library. You can find a lot more events by visiting our website. Thank you very, very much for joining us.